Well, this is chapter 22, Community Ecology. And by the end of this lecture, you should know the importance of a keystone species and how they interact in their communities. And more specifically, we're going to be talking about bees in this chapter. Uh, you will also understand how food chains and food webs work and describe how energy flows through them. And last but not least, you're going to explain the positive and negative interactions that occur in a community. So what's happening to honeybees? You've probably, I mean, you should have heard about this by reading the chapter, but you've probably heard a little bit about honeybees um, in the most recent years that there's lots of sort of campaigns to kind of save the bees. And this is one of the reasons. So something, um, you know, a few years back, maybe 10 years back, uh, came about that was called colony collapse disorder or CCD. And there's essentially no one reason they don't know why this is happening but it totally collapses the entire honey um, or the entire beehive essentially and there's very few that usually remain if any in the in hives that are affected by colony collapse disorder so you can see uh, this is a map of the US for 2014 to 2015 annual losses of managed honeybees colonies by state and the black is obviously the most infected or the most affected, I should say. Um, but you can see that across the board, we had really, really bad colony collapse disorder and lots of different beehives, which leads to a total loss of that hive. Um, and it's happening so frequently. And researchers still aren't completely sure why, although they have a few different reasons that are probably at least part of it, if not all of it. So when we're talking about bees, we want to go through and kind of think about why they're so important. And to do that, we've got to think about the community as a whole and really the ecosystem as a whole. So when we're looking at something like bees in a community or in an ecosystem, we're focusing on what's called community ecology. And we care so much about bees, right, because they're pollinators. So they're associated with the evolution of flowering plants. Flowering plants, remember, are angiosperms. So these were the last plants to kind of evolve and come about. So we had lots of plants before that that essentially weren't able to be pollinated by insects like bees, um, or they would be pollinated by wind. So this kind of helped the evolution of flowering plants when we had so many um, bees and different insects that could actually carry out the pollination because it's much more specialized and much more likely to happen via insects than it is by wind or self-pollination. So pollen is just a small thick-walled plant structure that contains cells that develop into sperm. And we'll go over how the bees actually pollinate, but the process of pollination is just transferring pollen from male to female plant structures so that that fertilization can occur. We'll go over it a little bit um, later in this lecture. But just to keep in mind, about 75% of flowering plants or our angiosperms are dependent on insect pollinators, which means that they can't self-pollinate and they can't just pollinate semi-randomly with wind, they have to be pollinated by some sort of insect. Okay, so that's why we refer to bees as a keystone species. Okay, so a keystone species basically means that it's a species in which other species depend on. So it kind of holds the community together. And if this species were to go away, this keystone species were to go away, it would have a really negative and dramatic impact on the community and the ecosystem as a whole. Okay, and community, I don't think we've defined, we went over population a little bit last lecture and we went over what um, a community is a little bit as well and it's when you have more than two different populations interacting in the same area so we have different populations that are within a community and then when we consider all abiotic and biotic factors that's when we have an entire ecosystem so as a keystone species you can see bees right here in the middle and they don't necessarily mean that they're the most abundant member of that community but their loss has a really dramatic effect so you can picture like an arch like you're seeing right now and if we were to take out the bee everything else would just collapse in right and it doesn't mean that the bee is doing all the most important work or it's um, the most abundant creature that we have necessarily although they are 
usually fairly abundant, but it means that pretty much everything else would collapse. So that's a keystone species, and that's why they're so important. That's why there's a big push to be able to save the bees right now, especially. So when we're talking about bees as a keystone species, if you think about the kinds of crops or the kinds of food that you eat, almost 90% of these crops that you're seeing here are pollinated by bees. So I think it ends up being a little over like 75% of most food that we regularly eat is by bees or one in every three bites of food we eat is pollinated directly or indirectly by honeybees. But I think it's actually a little bit more than that. So that's actually quite a bit. You can see almonds is huge down here and raspberries are a little bit smaller, but you can see how many foods are pollinated by bees. And you've probably heard like we would, we would starve if we didn't have honeybees. That's probably not necessarily true. We probably wouldn't necessarily starve because we would still be able to eat things that do self-pollinate or pollinate by wind like wheat or corn or rice. Um, but if you take a look at these uh, like supermarket pictures here, you can see produce choices with bees up here on the top and then without bees here on the bottom. And you can see what a difference there is in the selection that we would have and overall how much food we would have as well. And it would be drastically impacted and significantly reduced compared to what we have now with a pretty, well, arguably healthy bee population across the world, um, although it is in sharp decline in comparison to beforehand, essentially. So our pollinators are the ones that basically go through and take pollen from one flower to another, transferring it from the male to the female, right? So we have a fertilized egg that develops into an embryo containing a seed. So if you look down here at the apple, so this is kind of the end result, right? We have a fruit that we're developing and the ovary sort of surrounds the seed here. The seed develops within the ovary that's within the fruit. And all of that is developing, obviously, from the ovary, which is from the female. But what happens basically is a bee visits the flower in search of nectar and pollen, and the pollen from the anthers at the head of the stamen. So the stamen is the male reproductive structure, and it contains both a filament. So stamen here is the male reproductive. Um, it contains both a filament and it contains anthers as well. And basically, the anthers are at the head of the stamen sticks, um, at the head of the stamen, and that's what sticks to the bee's body. So that's where the bee is essentially picking up this pollen. So then this bee goes to another plant of the same species, goes on over here, and now it's going to transfer the sticky um, pollen, or transfer the pollen grains that are on its, like, legs essentially and it's going to transfer it to something called the stigma so the pistil is the female reproductive organs of the plants and the stigma is really sticky so it's basically like the sticky landing pad that collects all the pollen from the bees and it's connected to this style the style is a tube-like structure that leads from the stigma straight to the ovary so basically the stigma collects all that pollen through a sticky pad and then it makes its way down through the style into the ovary where it can actually fertilize and then become an embryo and turn into a seed down here. So it's a pretty cool little process um, that's relatively complicated when you really think about everything that has to happen and all, the, all that these bees are doing as well. Okay, so now we're gonna kind of switch gears in some sense to talking about food chains. Um, and you've probably heard about food chains or food webs or trophic communities, and that's kind of all the same thing that we're generally gonna talk about right now. So food chains are basically linked sequences of feeding relationships in a community. And you can kind of think of it like a pyramid, like even when you think of like nutritional values, right? You start off at the bottom and work your way up. We're kind of doing the same thing in a food chain most of the time. So we categorize this or organize it by who eats who. So at the very bottom here, these are our producers. Okay. So our producers are the autotrophs. So these are the ones that can make their own energy, right? So they supply energy all the way up to the rest of the food chain. 
And then from the producers, that's only our first level all the way up. Now we have consumers. And there's different levels of consumers. There's primary consumers, secondary, um, tertiary, quaternary, like it just goes on and on and on until you get to the very top of the food web or of the food chain, right? But producers are always at the bottom. These are our photosynthesizers, essentially, that can supply their own energy. And then consumers are the heterotrophs that eat the producers. And they might be heterotrophs that eat other heterotrophs, but essentially the bottom line is here is that they're heterotrophs and they can't produce their own energy. Okay, so within these food chains, we do also have predators. So predator is any organism that feeds on another, right? So like prey. Even herbivores, so like our little um, deer over here, even herbivores that are only eating plants, they're still preying on plants, I guess you can say. So they're, they're still um, actively involved in predation on plants, which may or may not kill the plant, but it doesn't matter either way. They are still considered a predator in that sense. So when we talk about trophic levels, it's just the feeding levels based on the positions in a food chain. So again, we start at the very bottom with our photosynthesizers, our producers here, and then we work our way up consumers. So the very first one is usually our primary consumer, and that those are usually herbivores. So those are the ones directly eating our producers. And then we go up to secondary and beyond consumers. Um, that tend to be carnivores. Sometimes you can get herbivores up there or um, even more so omnivores that will eat both, right, plants and meat. But the important thing is, is you think about these trophic levels and you think about the food web and the food chain, who do we see more of? Do we see more hawks and more like big top apex level predators or do we see more producers? Right. Obviously, we see more producers and that's really important for our ecosystem as a whole. But why do we see more producers and we don't see quite as many apex predators? And the reason is, as we're working our way up the food chain or up this food web, we're losing energy with each step. So producers. So this is actually blueberry bushes down here. Right. So these blueberry bushes here are obtaining their energy straight from the sun. So they're getting 100 percent of that energy from the sun. But now a mouse is going to eat this blueberry down here, but he's actually only going to get 10% of the energy that came from that blueberry because he's going to lose a lot of it to metabolism or heat um, or even waste as waste products. And then when it goes up to the next level, we're going to lose another 90% essentially. So each step you lose 90%. So each step is only getting 10% of the actual nutrition from the following step. So in this example, we start with 100%, right? We go to only 10% and then we're at about 1% um, because we can't be at zero. You are still going to get some um, energy from any food source. But because we're losing so much energy, it means that to feed these apex predators like a hawk, it requires so much more energy, which means it requires so much more food. And we just don't have the resources to support that kind of a population of apex predators, which is why you see so many more producers and even more um, primary consumers like herbivores than you do these apex predators, just because we we lose so much energy through that whole chain that we can't keep up with the resources for that. So that's the reason that you'll see um, you'll see less of those and more at the bottom of the food chain. So when we're talking about food webs here, now we're basically interconnecting all of the feeding relationships that happen in a community. Again, remember a community is multiple populations. So you can see here we've got lots of different species and you can see how complex this food web is. And honestly, they get way more complex. Uh, they will be pretty similar to this, if not simpler for you guys in this course, but they can get pretty crazy. And if you um, attempt to make your own food webs for some of the activities that you might see, which I highly suggest, it is um, it can be a little overwhelming and it can be a little bit confusing trying to place animals in the right place, um, especially if you don't really know what they eat, right? But we start here again at the very bottom with our producers. These are our herbivore, or sorry, our um, autotrophs that can photosynthesize. And then we move up 
usually to our herbivores, right? So we also have our bees here, and then you have different things that eat bees, like skunk, toad, spider, um, and then you have what would eat a spider, let's say, and you've got a bird. So it just keeps going, but you do have like big apex predators, like let's say a bear, that do still eat these producers. So they'll eat some blueberries, um, but they'll eat honey as well. They'll also eat, say, salmon. So these guys are considered omnivores. So they're eating both plants and animals. So when you're thinking about food webs and how the food chain would work, you always start from the bottom and move your way up to the top. So let's say we started at the bottom with grass, and then what would eat grass? Let's say a grasshopper. What would eat grasshopper? Let's say salmon. And then who would eat the salmon? A bear, right? So you're working your way up and usually you tend to get larger in size, but that's not necessarily always the case. Okay, so now we're gonna talk a little bit about symbiotic relationships. So these are basically relationships in which two different organisms can live together often interdependently so they're not actually depending on each other but this is something that's really important when you're looking at community ecology and looking at how the community interacts with um, or how different populations within the community essentially can interact with one another so there's three different forms of symbiosis and they're all very different so the first one is parasitism which you guys have probably heard of parasites that's not necessarily a beneficial symbiosis Mutualism is beneficial, commensalism is beneficial for one and doesn't harm the other, essentially. So symbiosis can be both positive and negative. Okay, okay so first up, we've got parasitism. So parasitism is where one member benefits at the expense of the other. So a good example here, since we are talking quite a bit about bees and what could possibly lead to colony collapse disorder, is they do have a pest or a parasite that is potentially leading to this. It's called the Varroa mite. And it's been a pretty big indicator or a big um, player in pathogens of bees. So it parasitizes both the larvae and the adult bees. And it gets all of its nutrition um, from those bees, from the larvae, and it just leaves their immune system completely suppressed. So it really opens them up for a different disease and stuff as well. And if the hives are infected with the mites, they're really susceptible to fatal infections caused by different bacteria and viruses. So finding these in your hive is not a good thing whatsoever. And parasitism in general is only good for one species. The other one is harmed. Um, it doesn't mean that they always die necessarily, but it does tend to lead to that depending on what species we're looking at. Mutualism, so this is the, the best option basically, right? So this is a symbiotic relationship in which both members are benefiting. So a good example is like bees and flowering plants. Both of them are benefiting, right? Bees are getting, um, they're able to get nutrition, they're able to get pollen to make honey and plants are able to essentially that's the only way they have sex and reproduce is by pollination so they're able to reproduce and continue their genes and continue their reproduction on um so that's super important uh, another example is bacteria living in not just bee guts honestly even our guts we have mutualistic bacteria that live in us and obviously it's a nice home for them they get to live and they get to thrive and it's good for us too it protects against different pathogens this is this goes for us as well as bees. Last one is commensalism. So this is where one benefits and the other is unharmed. So a good example of this is um, you will commonly find beehives in hollows of trees. And the bees are benefiting from this, right? Because they have a place that has shelter that's provided by the tree and they get to actually have their whole hive there and they can make honey and they don't have to worry about other predators, right? And this doesn't necessarily hurt or harm the tree, right? It's not really harmed by this. It doesn't do anything to it. It doesn't bring any sort of benefits to it. So this is what we refer to as commensalism. Okay, so what is happening to the honeybees? As I've kind of alluded to already, it's, we're not quite sure. Right, it could be parasitism, so it could be that parasitic varroa mite that we are talking about that really suppresses the immune system in bees. There's also a parasitic fungus called Nosema serenae, 
And that one is also pretty disruptive and destructive. There's also B AIDS as well as Israeli acute paralysis virus virus, IAPV, or invertebrate iridescent virus, IIV. So there's quite a few different forms of parasitism, and I would say that the Varroa mite is probably the most common and most well-known, at least to my knowledge. Um, but the other ones do occur as well, and there's a possibility that it's a few of them at play and not just one or the other. The other thing that they're kind of concerned about and think that might lead to CCD or even just a general decrease in bee populations, malnutrition. Okay. So when we talk about bees, they have a really broad niche. And a niche or a niche, you might have heard it called too, but a niche is just the space, the environmental conditions, and the resources that a species need in order to survive and reproduce. So particularly bees, they have a really broad one. So they can go and get nectar or pollen from lots of different kinds of plants, right? They tend to go to really brightly colored yellow, blue, and purple flowers. Um, but they can go to quite a few plants and they do visit thousands of plants relatively quickly, especially compared to other pollinators. Whereas if you look at butterflies, butterflies are really mostly attracted just to red flowers that have horizontal petals that allow the butterfly to actually land and pollinate. Moths like the flowers that have a really strong, sweet fragrance. And hummingbirds, you can kind of tell by the way their beak is designed, right? They like these tube-like flowers so that they can get in there and pollinate. So they each have their own ecological niche and they fulfill that within the community. Um, but some of them are more broad and some of them are more specific. So if these overlap, if you have two or more species that are relying on those same limited resources, that's when you get competition. Competition isn't necessarily always a bad thing, but usually it's a bad thing for at least one of the species. And this is what we refer to as competitive exclusion principle. And basically it just means that one of these competing species is gonna be driven to extinction. Keep in mind, extinction doesn't happen super quickly in most cases. We are seeing things go extinct in our lifetime that seem to be occurring at a much faster rate than we've ever really seen or noticed before, but it's not usually that quick. So, you know, they might be able to live together um, in some way for quite a while, but eventually the reproductive success of the one that can outcompete the other is going to cause the other one to go to extinction. Okay, so as you're competing for resources, there's a few different ways that you can essentially assure that you are going to be the winner that comes out on top. Um, or the way that we kind of keep that competition in check. So one is food partitioning, right? And so we look at a native bee like the blueberry bee, and these guys can coexist with non-native bees like our Western honeybees, the bees that we normally hear and think about. Um, these guys are not native. They came originally from Europe, but they can specialize on all sorts of different kinds of food, right? They could also go to blueberry flowers, but they don't utilize it quite as efficiently as a blueberry bee does. So a blueberry bee can live with honeybees because they will specifically go for the blueberry flowers while honeybees will essentially go for everything else. Okay. You can also have generalist foraging patterns. So these are our honeybees that can forage over really big distances and they feed on a variety of flowers. So they usually can feed year round, especially in warmer climates. And they're also really successful in their competition with other bees because they can go everywhere essentially and a lot of other bee species have really limited niches like the blueberry bee that can only survive on blueberries uh, flowers so you know these guys if they're more generalist have a better shot they also when they're competing for resources can have really defensive behavior so this is when we hear about the africanized honeybees or they've also been termed the killer bees Right, and these guys compete pretty successfully because they're so aggressive and they'll chase off other pollinators away from the available food, um, sometimes even stinging them and paralyzing or killing them. That's how they got the name. One of the biggest um, plights to bees seems to be human impact. And a big part of it, you might wonder like why we have these lawns and this crop field down here. A big part of it is our agriculture. Right, so we've got suburban areas like say this picture here, what do you see in it? You see a house obviously, and you see a nice big lawn. 
do you see any flowers? So if we're not planting flowers for these bees, they essentially don't have any food and they don't have any job, and so you're not really gonna have them there. So they are essential, but if we don't have anything for them to occupy as a niche, then they're not gonna be able to do it. So having this suburban sprawl or development is really kind of causing a decrease in these bees' natural forage areas. We also have these things called monocrops. Sorry, I know it's kind of hard to see on here, but monocrops, mono meaning one, right? So if we plant, say, only almonds, if we only have almonds here, that's the only thing that bee can pollinate for maybe hundreds of miles, because that's how we tend to plant things now, is we have monocrops. So we have large, large fields of just one sort of crop, and it doesn't really inter or overlap with different areas. So it fragments their habitat into these non-overlapping zones so that they can actually pollinate more than one kind of crop, which leads to really poor nutritional value for these bees. So shrinking and fragmented habitats is definitely a problem and it's definitely something that at least we're becoming a little bit more aware of and people are hopefully trying to help out with. Um, so if you do have a house, try to plant some flowers, try to break up the fragmented habitats and give the bees something um, to kind of provide them with some nutritional value. It could also be something like parasites that come via the varroa mites, or it could be fungal parasites. It could be food stress and corn syrup, right? Because we do tend to feed some of our commercial bees on corn syrup. Um, so that's, again, not a very high nutritional value, as you might imagine. Uh, <clears throat> one of the big issues, too, is po possibly pesticides like neonicotinoids. And these are basically an artificial form of nicotine that we use as a pretty um, common pesticide on different crops. And this has been found in large quantities in different beehives, and they tend not to be very successful when they are ha being exposed to this pesticide. There's also the other viral pathogens like acute Israeli paralysis virus. Um, and then climate change is another one too, just because Bees are really vulnerable to extreme weather events, right? So they have to kind of coordinate their activities with flowering times. And if flowering times are changing, if they're becoming earlier or later in the year, depending on how the climate is changing in that specific region, then bees are probably going to be a little bit thrown off. They might not actually be able to organize with that time and not be able to get the nutritional value that they need or be able to pollinate the flowers that we need them to. They're also, since they're so vulnerable to extreme weather events, if we have a big freezing, if we have a lot of rainfall, um, a hurricane, anything like that, which tends to get more dramatic and more frequent with climate change, then that obviously kills off bees in large portions when we have any sort of dramatic weather event like that. So as far as human impact, we are starting to sort of realize it. And you'll see a lot of like celebrity beekeepers that are getting into it and pushing this, um, which sounds super fun. So I would highly encourage it too. But we are trying to some degree, although not as much as we probably should, to break up fields of monocultures and have lots of different bee-friendly plants. Um, a lot of people are also trying to use pesticides sparingly, although it's still a pretty heavy issue as well as becoming beekeepers. So you see um, different people or different brands kind of promoting different things. So like haagen has vowed to donate a certain amount of money um, from each of their like bee-friendly products essentially to go to saving the bees. So you see this in different products sometimes. So it's kind of cool um, and it's always good to sort of go towards that cause. But that's basically why bees are so important in our community or in our ecosystem as a whole really and why we are working to protect them more now than ever now that we're kind of realizing how much of an impact humans are having on bee populations as well.